Far east of the Sword Coast, the Shadowvar and Discoverin have fallen. The Shadow Storm is no more. Sembia is fractured into city-states. A mysterious hero rises from the ashes to usher in a new era of prosperity. Yet there is still suffering. Cormir and the wild elves of the Dale Lands offer war on all sides. Earth motes, madness, and shadow dragons plague the lands. These are the tales of the heroes who ended that suffering. 1491 DR, the year of Sembian revival. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Long Winded One. I want to welcome somebody to the podcast tonight who, if you've listened to my podcast this far in season four, he really won't need an introduction because he voiced most, or, uh, sorry, all of the Erevis Kale novels. Um, he was the voices of Erevis Kale and Drasic Riven. Uh, so please welcome John Pruden to the podcast. Hi, Jared. How are you? Thanks for having me. Good, good. Well, we have um, I have a series of questions uh, that I'm going to ask you, all of which I've shared with you ahead of time. And I, you know, they usually start with a little bit of like get to know you kinds of questions. So, um, if it's okay with you, mm-hmm. I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Absolutely, great. Well, in doing some research about you before before we set up these interviews, I I, I was intrigued. Um, it seems like. You have had, um, and this happens a lot with the people I interview. You, you've had a lot of different kinds of jobs. From you know, um, obviously, uh, you're you, you were in the army. You were a black hop, uh, black hawk helicopter pilot. Um, you've done improv. You've done just a huge amount of of uh, audiobook recording. And if I understand it correctly, you've been to most of the U.S. states. Um, so I was wondering if you could kind of like piece all of this together and connect the dots for us. Yeah, as you and I were discussing before uh, before we started I, I grew up outside of Cincinnati in Ohio when I was <laughs> when I was in school I was always goofing off and mimicking people and you know doing imitations and cutting up and stuff and the all, the other kids always picked me to be the like the lead in plays that we put on so I was always a performer but never really thought about doing it as a living I went to Ohio State and majored in aviation and uh, went into the army to fly helicopters, uh, and that's how I ended up in Korea, uh, and spent time in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Those are those two places mostly. And when I got out of the army, then I worked various jobs until I started doing voiceovers, and I did my first audio book in 2008, and I I really liked it basically because. When you do voiceovers, it's a lot of work to get the next job. You have to do a lot of marketing, a lot of cold calls, and you get a lot of rejection. But with audiobooks, you get a book and you're busy for a week or two. And you don't have to, you know, a lot of times people just email you and say, hey, can you do this book? Can you do this book? And the, the work just lines up. So, uh, And I like being able to kind of go back to, you know, what I did as a kid and, and use voices. And, um, you know, I, I joke with my friends. I say, what job wouldn't be more perfect than working in your pajamas playing cowboys and Indians, you know? <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's been great. So I, I work at home um, and now I get paid to goof off in my, in my recording booth. I, I live on a small ranch in Colorado now with my wife and two dogs, 10 chickens and all the coyotes, bears and mountain lions that pass through. And it's uh, it's the best job I've ever had. I've, <laughs> I have had a lot of different jobs. Well, let, let's let's go right on to the next question then. Um, and this will drill really uh, closely into sort of what our topic is is about. Um, y- you have um, you have read for several Forgotten Realms novels and series, uh, including Sembia, uh, Sword of the God, Twilight War, Erevis Kale, the Elminster books, uh, House of Serpents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it seemed like maybe a lot of this work came out in around 2013, at least on Audible. Can, can I can I ask? Because I'm really curious about how all of this works. How were you approached to read for for the realms, or or did you did you seek them out? This is this is really funny about this series of of books because uh, Audible 
produces books as well as just puts them up on the website. And they approached me back in 2012, late 2012, and they had this thing going on that they were they were trying to publish as many audiobooks as they could as quickly as they could. So they came up with the concept of a 13-week contract. And they would give you a list of books. And to uh, complete the contract, you had to do so many finished hours. And that's, you know, some of the books are 5.8 hours long or 6.7 hours or 10.2 hours. And you had to have a certain number done by the end of the 13 weeks to get paid. But the thing of it was, you couldn't pick the books. They just said, here's a list of books. Do you want this or not? That was it. And the first contract had, uh, oh man, I don't remember how many books, but it was it was a lot. And you had to do them as quickly as possible. Uh, and it was pretty stressful. It was You had to do them so quickly. They were so compressed that there's a lot of prep time in doing a book. Uh, and I had no time to prepare. So I usually you have to read the book ahead of time. And I many times I couldn't do that. So I just had to guess. And it, I, I want to say that some of the books were given to me out of order. And I didn't know anything about Forgotten Realm or, Realms or, or any of the books or which ones were supposed to be in what order. <laughs> you know, so Wow. I, and, and I didn't even, you know, I wouldn't know until I got to the fourth book and realized, you know, I was narrating book one and I was like, oh crap. <laughs> you know, so it was, uh, it was really pretty bizarre. And you, you know, you crank through, you do the 13 week contract and you decide if you want another 13 week contract or not. And the, the unusual part about it is that that's not how it usually happens. You can, you get a book, you prep it, you do it, you, you, you schedule it yourself. You can put as much stress on yourself as you want. And I would have plenty of time between, between books to, to, do that, uh, to do that necessary prep. Yeah. Well, do you know, do they communicate with Wizards of the Coast in, in this production process? Is there, you know, is there any kind of like a voice loyalty to uh, people who have read for certain characters in the past? Like h- how do they decide all of this or is it completely random? In, in my case, it was completely random. Um, it it depends on it. It gets pretty complicated. It depends on the author if the author is even alive. If the author has a family or a group or business that that handles their their uh, their books, so the author can just sell the rights to a book, and then Audible owns it. Typically, the author keeps the rights to the book, and Audible buys the audible the the audio rights and depending on what the contract is the the author can say oh we had you know john pruden read books one and two i definitely want him for three or john pruden read one and i didn't like him let's switch to somebody else so did did you get a chance to interact at all with paul kemp or ed greenwood or lisa smedman you know my my wife laughs because i don't i don't throw anything away and i have like 40,000 emails uh, going all the way back to 2008. And I looked it up and and I do remember speaking to Paul Kemp uh, by email. And we emailed back and forth uh, quite a bit, uh, mostly over pronunciation, but not with uh, with Ed Greenwood or Lisa Smedman. One, one funny thing was when I looked back at the emails uh, to prep for this interview, uh, I saw that I had sent my my girlfriend, she's my wife now, back in 2012, an email that I, I put in the subject line, kidding, of course, why I hate Ed Greenwood. And yeah. there was a sen- there was a sentence from the book, and I copied it, and I'm I'm going to butcher it here because I don't have the the research in front of me, but it was like Tenethert Sharuna Ray. Danares uihim rebriva toneth utala tabus torin o wilin torin dala barbern. It was like, and I told her in the email, it's like someone kicked the Scrabble board. <laughs> well, that's that's Ed Greenwood for you. He's um, he's the creator of Forgotten Realms, you know, and and he 
he's just a font of knowledge. And um, I think what I've interviewed uh, several people who have worked with Ed in the past and, and he's just like, you, you know, you ask him a question and you get, you just get pages and pages and pages of information. And that, that sounds about right. <laughs> well, so you, you mentioned a little bit about how you normally prepare for a reading. Um, I was wondering, so you, you typically like not when you're necessarily working with audible here in back, back in the 2012, 2013, but, but typically you, you get a chance to read the book first and like plan for characters. Right. Or can you, can you walk us through that? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, um, and it used to be, uh, I used to work for this one company, they would send me a paperback and I had to read from a paperback and the, <laughs> The funny thing was, is uh, you don't want to hear somebody turning a page when they're reading the book. So people got really good at flipping the pages because you actually actually had to read the book. And what I would do on a paperback is I would cut the spine off. I'd get a jigsaw out and I'd cut the spine off so I could make them individual pieces of paper. And some of these books had really small print. Not these particular books, but other books, in, you know, in general. So I took them to like, uh, you know, Kinko's or office depot to get them copied and you know blown up and the people are like do you own this book no then we can't copy it you don't have copyright pre-. you know i was like oh man so i read these tiny little print you know but t- now nowadays they send you a pdf and sometimes they send you the book in a in a document format and you have to be careful not to change anything because you can slip up on the keys and delete a paragraph or something but the pdfs work really nice and uh, so you read the book, and I have uh, I have a you know two documents set up on my screen. On the left is the book, and on the right is a spreadsheet. And I write down every word that I know I don't how to don't know how to say, and every word that I think I know how to say. Because if you think you do, you're wrong. If you're certain, you should still look some of them up. And then then I have another you know row, another column rather with characters' names, and then anything that the author says about the character you know, their age, their background, uh, anything, uh, because that's all clues into how that person should sound. Um, and then with, with character development in, in particular, you know, and, and these doing series books, especially out of order, you want to pay very, very close attention because you don't want to find out on, you know, page 287, that all of a sudden the main character has a Cockney accent, you know, so you, so you have to read the book and that's, that's, that's mandatory for fiction because you never know what's going to happen. Nonfiction. You do a book about world war two. You have to research the names, but everybody pretty much knows how world war two turned out. So there's no surprise ending, but the spy novels can be hard when it's one person disguises their voice in the book, but you know, you know, you don't know who it is, but because it's written word of what they said. But when you do it as a narrator, that's kind of a giveaway to who the secret person really is. So you got to be really, yeah. really careful about that stuff. So once you finish the book, you look up the words, you, you do all the research for that, and then you begin recording and you record from beginning to end. So what I do is I use a program called Pro Tools. And when I first say uh, a character's lines, I put a marker there so I can go back to it and, you know, have that person's specific voice. So when they come up later in the book, I can go back to the marker and do the, the voice for that character and continue on. So you go from beginning to end. So you record, you record the book the best you can, and then you send it off, uh, usually by... FTP to the publisher. And then the publisher has a proofer who reads it and listens at the same time. And then they create a spreadsheet and they mark down all the mistakes you make. And, uh, or I don't like to call them mistakes. I'll call them corrections needed. And then uh, they send you a list of corrections needed. Then what I have to do is um, a lot of times they'll have the recording of the mistake. So you can, you can set the tempo, the pace, the right voice and whatnot, say the correction, record it, go through the list, and then you send that back to them and you're done. You move on to the next book. Oh, wow. So you, d- you don't have to splice it all together or do a lot of that post-production work other than the recording. They, they, they stitch it together for you generally? 
Right. That that's the that's the best way to do it because then you can move on to the next book. Um, the there's a, a, a organization a website called ACX, the uh, Audiobook Creative Exchange, where authors get together, and it's also run by Amazon Audible. Authors get together with narrators, and they collaborate, and they put the book together. And uh, so, if you came to me, Jared, with a book and said, "Here's here's my book," I I could be the producer, I could also be the narrator, but I would hire out the proofer, the editor, the engineer, which could be one person. And then they put it all together and then you and I, you know, handle all the, the payment and I pay them. So some people do what we call full production themselves. They do the proofing, the editing, the engineering, the narrating, the whole thing. So they're, you know, they, they do the whole package, but I prefer to do the book, move on to the next book. You let somebody else do, do all that, uh, detail work. Well, let's, let's switch gears a little bit and drill more into, um, kind of, you know, what, what we're talking about here is there, could you give us like in any kind of behind the scenes look on the Erebus Kale or the Twilight War novels, you know, and you can talk whatever fan reactions, you know, character prep, whatever it is that you want to share with us. Well, uh, you, you try and interact as much as possible, but a lot of times there's nobody to interact with. You know, especially if the author is no longer living or, um, you know, it's an older book. Um, with Wizards of the Coast, they put me in touch. And, and sometimes there is mandatory contact. You know, they say, you have to talk to Hillary Ross at Wizards of the Clo- Coast. And and her and I worked together on pronunciations. And it was kind of funny. I remember, uh, you know, she says, well, I don't have a lot of pronunciations that you need because this is a new book, you know, the, the author just came up with it. It may refer back to other stuff. So she really liked me because I got to pronounce some of the things, however I wanted. And then she used that as the Rick, the record, you know, that, that became the, the pronunciation of record. Um, I, you know, and I coordinated with, uh, with Paul on, uh, pronunciation, uh, an important aspect of narrating professionally is efficiency, which means doing it right and quickly. Uh, but like I said, there was no time for character prep in this one. I just had to kind of kind of wing it. And uh, you had asked me earlier about fan reaction, which was funny because I, you know, lots and lots of narrators say if you go on Audible and you look up your books, do not read the written reviews. Don't waste your time. And I love to read them because some of them are just hilarious. Uh, and you do learn a lot. You know, sometimes you, know, you learn about, you have to, I think you have to read them because you learn about the listeners. And I'll tell you what, fantasy listeners are hardcore fans. They're, they're like romance fans. They know all the characters. They know all the pronunciations. They know everything in great detail. And they like things a certain way, and they hate it when something is mispronounced. And uh, I found out, for instance, a lot of the listeners like a brisk narration, and they thought I read too slowly. But a lot of people never commented, so I guess they were fine with that. If uh, uh, they heard another narrator do a, a, a character or a book, and then you know they switched to John Pruden, a lot of times they like the first narrator they heard. Just because, you know, it's like uh, news you hear from from uh, a, a person, that's that's the authority to you, you know. That's the voice you like. Um, but And the reviews could be pretty brutal, too. But I, I, they average out to about 50-50 positive, negative. Um, somebody wrote, I, look, I looked some up before, before we talked to, to talk tonight. And somebody wrote, John Pruden is a phenomenal narrator. He gives Kale and Riven and all the other characters the grittiness and dark undertones deserving of this fantasy series. Absolutely loved it. Wish he would narrate all the Forgotten Realms novels. And then the next one is, I couldn't get past the first chapter. The narration is some of the worst I have ever heard. Yeah, I think it's what you said, though, because I I don't believe um, so. The the very first Sembian novel was a collection of short stories um, called the called the Halls of of Stormweather, and there's a short story in there about Erebus Kale, and 
that was the only time I believe that you didn't narrate an Erebus Kale novel or short story, right? So it could have it could have been that people were used to, you know, that want that that first narrator, and then you know, because I, I'll, I'll admit it, when when I picked up the first Erebus Kale novel and I and I heard your voice, I thought this is not what I'm used to. But very quickly, your your voice became Erebus Kale's voice to me. Oh, well, that's that's cool. That's and that's why I always like listen, listening or hearing from listeners because you, we don't know. We just we live in this little <laughs> you know little tiny booth in our basement, and uh, you know we come out see the sun you know once every couple of days, and you step outside and you're like, when did it snow? <laughs> yeah, well, um, right now you have a little over. 250, I think at last count was 261, 261 books on Audible. Um, a lot of them are nonfiction. Um, but I'm curious out of those 261 books, you know, there's a lot of these books here from series like that, like the Elminster books are an example. So I'm wondering, I'm, what I'm wondering about is like, you know, some of these books can be written and produced many years apart. So, so I'm wondering, like, do you do, you kind of mentioned this before, but but as as a creator, as 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 the the authoritative voice of some of these characters, do you feel compelled to to continue a series once you start it? Well, it depends on the story. <laughs> I've I've done some series that weren't fantasy, where we would say, you know, the author told a one hour story over the course of six hours, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, oh my god, it goes on forever and ever. I hope I never. Or I had I had one that you know, and I can't can't really talk too detailed about it, but there were so many things in it that were just plain wrong from a technical aspect. Because I have an aviation background, I'm also a firearms instructor, and there was a lot of things that that were just hard to read because you have to read how how they're written. Um, but then there's other series where you're like, oh man, this is I did a World War II uh, historical fiction. And this guy did submarine novels, and usually it was naval stuff that I that I loved. And when I didn't get like you know the third book, I was really disappointed. But uh, so sometimes you love to do it, but other times you don't have a choice because maybe the author has you do their first book, and they don't like you, and they they move to another narrator, and then that narrator has it, you know, for whatever reason uh, for the for the next two or three books. But then again, I've seen authors use a different narrator for every book they write. So it's, you know, so many, so many aspects of this industry are just kind of a crapshoot. As far as like Wizards of the Coast goes and their novel series, they're doing, they're doing very few, you know, we, we, I've interviewed a lot of authors who have had series basically cut short. Um, and, uh, and it's mostly just because they, they really kind of stopped producing a lot in their novel lines. They, they still do some, um, but, but it, you know, I know Paul Kemp, for example, would, would love to, to finish his, you know, Godborn was the beginning, I think, of a, another trilogy. So uh, I'll just put a bug in your ear about this. If they ever uh, do another two books in the Godborn series, I'm really hoping you come back for that. <laughs> well, that, that's why, uh, I, like, I, you know, my wife says I, I keep too many things, but I have to keep every book so I can go back and, and go, how did that character speak? you know, and and because the fans are counting on it. Sure. Well, so how, how does somebody go about hiring you? Uh, if, if, if they have a book and they, they just really love your work and your voice. Um, I I know you mentioned an audio exchange, but, but how, how does that typically happen? Do, do authors approach you for this? Usually authors are trying to figure out how to get their book done. And then the, the, the publisher says, well, you, you should also do it in audio. And they're like, well, I don't know anything about that. And then the publisher handles it all. I rarely ever talk to an author ahead of time. Um, and when I talk to an author after I've been assigned a book, usually it's just for pronunciation. Uh, out of the 275 plus books I've done, not all of them are on Audible. Um, I've probably talked to about five or 10 authors, maybe 10. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's kind of a lonely job because we don't, you know, it's great to talk to you because everything else is just emails. We don't talk to too many people, but it, it depends. So 
if you do like I've done it, like I described, I just like the narration, you develop relationships with publishers and producers, and then they get to know your style over time. And they're like, oh, Pruden's really good at uh, military history. And, you know, he does really good research. So sometimes they go, wow, this, this book's, this book's an, a research nightmare. Give it to Pruden. Uh, then when they're casting a book and they think of you as a good fit, they send you an email and see if you're uh, available for their publishing window. You know, can you fit this into this date? Uh, but sometimes, depending on, like I, I think I said earlier, the contract between the author and the publisher or who the rights holder is, the author may have a say-so in who is cast. So then the person doing the casting picks three or four narrators they think are going to be a good fit. and then have them audition so the author can pick one they like. And it's always, it's funny when, the, when they say you didn't pass the audition, but the first person couldn't do it. So your second choice. <laughs> that happened. And then sometimes the author is like, wow, this, you know, I liked, I liked this person. So they, they go with you. Uh, so it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's kind of a crapshoot. So the, for me, the ideal situation is just to sit back and let the emails come in and say, do you have time to do this book? And, uh, you know, it's a really good situation if you say, no, I don't have time. I'm too busy. Well, um, I asked you to do something for us tonight that I'm really excited about. Um, and I thought maybe this would be a good way to, to end our time together. Um, I wasn't sure if you were going to say yes, but you are very gracious and, um, have agreed to read a snippet, um, from an Erebus Kale. It's kind of ironic. It's, it's, it's a, a story about Erebus Kale and, and he actually doesn't do any talking in it, but, um, we, one of the characters that we know very well, Riven, does do some talking in it. And this is, um, this is a, uh, a, a snippet from a short story called All the Sinner's Saints. And it falls between um, the books Shadows Witness and Twilight Falling. And this is uh, kind of a preview of things to come for uh, Erevis Kale and uh, Drasic Riven uh, to start working together someday. Uh, so, Mr. Pruden, would you mind doing us the honor uh, to read this? I'd be happy to. And what I thought I would do is uh, give you an example of what I would have to do, you know, if this was like a regular job, because I did Riven's voice, what, eight years ago? Uh, so I, I went back to Twilight Falling and I looked up his voice and I have a, a, a sample of it. So what I would do is I just hit play. Maybe it's exactly what you think, Kale. Maybe it's exactly what you think, Kale. So that I just put that in my head. And then I would go to the recording. And all the sinners saints. My belief is on my terms, he thought to mask. Take it or leave it. As usual, Mask said nothing and gave him no sign. Before he had gotten a block, Riven's voice sounded from back up the street. Kale! Kale stopped and turned. Riven stood in the open window of Gauston's flat. Maybe he didn't bring us together to fight, Kale. Maybe he just wanted to bring us together. Ribbon's laugh rolled down the street. Think about it. We work well together, Kale. Too well, Kale thought, but said nothing. He walked away and headed for Stormweather Towers. Oh, man. I have goosebumps right now. No joke. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, no, that took me back. I just, um, there were so many moments in these stories and, and, you know, I got to enjoy these stories that, you know, there were gosh, uh, seven, eight of these books. Um, if you count, um, you know, the first novel and then the trilogy and then the second trilogy and then what would be the beginning of the third trilogy that got cut short. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's great. Well, well, John, I uh, really appreciate your time tonight and, uh, really looking forward to, 
you know, listening to many more of your books and I, I recommend people go check them out on Audible. Is there, is there anything you want to leave the listeners with tonight? No, just keep listening. It's a, it's a, it's a great way to, uh, uh, absorb stories because, and it's kind of recession proof, you know, back in 2008 when things weren't going so well, um, audiobooks were still growing and they have, they have never slowed down. Well, so many of us have a long commute or, you know, enjoy doing this. Uh, I actually discovered the Symbia series while I was mowing my lawn. <laughs> so, I mean, there's just, you know, so many reasons to listen. Um, and I, and I wish that there were more books available in an audiobook format, but thank you for all of your work and for your time tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jared, for having me on. Though this marks the end of the episode, the tale continues within a 10 day. Join us at longwinded.one and consider giving us a review on Apple Music, Spotify, or really whichever platform you choose.